So thank you so much for having me today. I'm delighted to take part in this talk for the FMA. And I'm joined by the incredible Inoa Elms. And today we're gonna to be discussing his work and his journey within the industry. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have you here today. Thank you so much. It's, it's brilliant to see you. You look fantastic as well. Thank you very much. I'm good. I'm good. It's um, it's a good day. The sun is out. It's shining. I'm wearing one of my favorite shirts. Um, I bought this when I was in South Africa um, seven years ago. Oh my god! I was walking through the markets and I and I saw this and I and I yeah. So I haven't worn this in quite some time, but I'm I'm wearing it. And it feels good. It's, it's a, yeah. I'm okay right now. How are Excellent. you? I'm very good indeed, and I'm here in my most festive and fabulous daffodils um, and we have to be fashionably fashionably on trend for our <laughs> discussion today so first things first i wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your creative journey and and really how did it all start um so i i'm primarily a poet um, and I worked exclusively as that when I first, um, from when I first started writing around 2002, 2003, until 2008, when I got a little bit tired of it all, of reading poems to audiences that weren't interested in the work and they were more interested in each other. Basically, I went to a really horrendous um, Glastonbury Music Festival where everything that was that could go wrong was going wrong at the same time. When I returned to London, um, I just wanted to read poems. The audiences just wanted to sit down and listen to stories. So I drifted into working in theater and then um, worked exclusively in that field until maybe 2017. And I've now begun to dip my fingers and toes into writing for television and writing films. Um, but everything circles back and germinates from poetry. So primarily I'm a poet, but I'm a writer and I write everything, including essays, articles. I interview people here and there. Um, I write poetry plays, screenplays, um, and I perform and I curate lots of events as well. That's excellent. It, it's such an incredible journey. Um, I, I'm really just, I was reading about you and I, I just, I find your work extremely inspirational. So I really want to, we really want to congratulate you for all of the beautiful and amazing work that you do. Just out of interest, you know, let's fast forward to today. And, you know, the last year and a half has been so tumultuous with COVID and Brexit and all of these kind of really, epic changes taking place. How did the pandemic and lockdown affect your personal artistic output? It made me switch drastically from curating events and performing to sitting back a little bit, um, writing text that other people could perform. It made me dip more into the television and film industries, but it also made me slow down and realize my insignificance. And this is what I mean. I curate so many things and program so many things. And there's this sense that if I'm not on top of it, the world would pause or my world would pause. And I had, and I felt like I was in control of so much and I have to be. But um, the pandemic brought a, a deep humility um, to understanding that the world will continue without me. I mean, we all know that on a sort of cerebral, psychological, perhaps intellectual level, but the, the pandemic meant that practically I had to see, I had to see that play out where I stopped moving and the world carried on without me. Everyone else were also in hiatus as I was, well, depending on where you are in the world. In Nigeria, for instance, nothing really stopped because of um, the need to work there because of the lack of things like social care and social welfare. So it, it made me understand deeper my position in the world the illusion of control, how much we can lose it. And the fact that things will take the time that they need to, you know, and I can lean into that rather than constantly being front footed and fighting to cross, the, to make things um, cross the line and push the low bar. Um, yeah, the pandemic brought humility to my work. A hundred percent. And even myself, I think even leading up to the pandemic and during the pandemic I had a lot of realizations really about life and stuff and also about 
this thing about timing mm -hmm. and the kind of idea that you know a lot of things in life are all about timing mm -hmm. and I really feel like the pandemic was this amazing opportunity for all of us to just slow down if there was if there was any silver lining at all yeah. to just slow down pause and take a second to really think about the things that we really really were the main thing that we really wanted to focus on and the things that we needed to focus on. And for you personally, was there any thing, I mean, you've already touched upon this at all already, but was there anything specific that you learned about yourself that you perhaps hadn't kind of noticed before or became more clear? Um, I developed a deeper connection to my own body which I didn't expect. It was because I wasn't running around as all, you know, as always doing things. I had to slow down. <clears throat> um, I, I was cooking every day, every, every day for myself. So being, you know, the phrase you are what you eat came into very sharp relief because I saw, you know, the repercussions of what I put into my body and how and what how that projected outwardly. Um, I developed a, uh, um, a habit for doing yoga, which I didn't have before. And also humbling just to realize that if I keep doing this thing over and over again, I'll be able to bend over and touch my toes. I could lift my leg higher than I have ever been able to. I've been grossly inflexible, but I started doing yoga in June and by September I could bend down and touch my toes and I'd never been able to do so before. And the thing is, I'm pretty slim. I haven't really put on that much weight. So bad posture, which was specific to my work as a writer, which means sitting down like this, was creating roadblocks in my, in my um, skeletal systems, in my muscular system. And, and I realized I, just by chipping away at this thing, by stretching and holding pauses, I could create flexibility in inflexible situations. But I've also begun to realize I can apply that to my work as, as well as a writer, but as a curator of events of just constantly chipping at things or waiting for the universe to bow to your demands, to your, to your requests rather. And that also works on a primary physical level just to keep on. So I think, I think understanding that, that lesson and how much time it took, but how, how, much, how, much, how much I cherish that, that process Again, it's, 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 it's taught me things about myself. Um, sorry. Yeah, 100%. I completely identify and agree with you. And actually, I think health, the body, fitness, these are a lot of things that a lot of people probably found themselves prioritizing and really engaging in and listening to because, mm -hmm. you know, we're rushing around, we're so busy in the 21st century. A lot of us are eating out, a lot of us are, you know, having takeaways or really eating fast food on the move. Whereas when the pandemic struck, you know, it was almost, you know, it was in some cases, it was difficult to even buy particular food. Mm -hmm. So it really forced us to look at our health, look at what we're eating and to do a lot more cooking. So I think that that is a great thing to really articulate. Now, while studying your amazing work, what became quite evident was that you had this illustrious and varied career and range of interests. So, you know, from classical to hip hop, then we have you know, Christian background and Muslim background. How do you allow all of these amazing influences in your work to flourish? Um, that's a good question, thank you. Um, but I, I, I don't allow them, and by that I mean, they are me. I represent them already. It is the world that tries to pigeonhole individuals and make and squash us down into one box or to label us as one thing. I think humanity is naturally hyphenated. We have been, we will continue to be, but we live in certain societies in which being able to be labeled as one thing makes you um, a commodity. It makes you um, visible 
and easily digestible in, in hyper-capitalist societies. And because I'm an immigrant, and because I didn't, I didn't come from any traditional educational backgrounds, I've always existed in the gray areas. I've always slipped between the lines of things, which meant that I had space to incubate myself and just be who I was. And um, I guess the, 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 the bigger platforms I occupy in my career, I've just incubated that idea of myself when I was you know, young and 18, 19, and no one cared what I did and, never, and, and therefore I, I wasn't making money for anybody. No one was paying me to do anything. Therefore I could just be whatever I wanted. I've tried to, to hold on to that in all my career. So I don't think of it as allowing myself. I've just always be this. I just, what I do is challenge the world to allow me to be myself in none of those spaces. Um, but, but I've always been a hyphenated hybrid creature. Um, but, but in so many aspects of society and life in pre-colonial Northern Nigeria, where I'm from, or even Southern Nigeria, um, we, we lived hyphenated lives. There were things that we had to, there were responsibilities we had in terms of society, the roles we played in terms of generational groups or whatever, but we're always more than one thing. We, we talk about how hyper patriarchal um, Nigerian um, societies and life in the villages were, but they weren't seen as that. Those labels were placed on us when we were colonized. You know, um, if you're going back three, 400 years, there were wives who were, there were women who were kings who had wives who were women, and there were king men who had boyfriends, who had young men who they had, you know, loving and sexual relationships with. And this was just it. And they weren't considered being straight homosexual. They, they just were, and this were how things unfolded. But in the advent of colonization, so much of what we did were liberalized or demonized. And then some of that echoes to the echoes out and, and, and creates um, just really difficult situations often that upper middle class black people and conservative black people put on, put on ourselves as some sort of standard to, to aspire to, which means that we're just editing part of our whole three-dimensional three selves um, out of existence, which is so problematic, you know, and it flowers, leads to mental health problems, it leads to breakdown in societies, breakdown in families, and yeah, um, yeah, sorry, I, I go on and on about this because of how much it destroys us, this hype. No, please continue, it's fascinating, continue. I think I've reached the end of my point, but we were hype, we are hyphenated individuals, and we have to let each other to be that at all times. Well, um, it's really interesting. You should mention a number of those different things. Um, I'm really inspired by a Nigerian woman called Margaret Echo, and she was really quite prevalent um, around about the time of kind of English British colonial rule. And what I found really fascinating about studying her work and her life was really just understanding that our culture, particularly in Africa and in West Africa, women were at the forefront of commerce. It was so much. the opposite of Western civilization. And it's quite unfortunate that because we live in this, through this kind of Western canon and this kind of Western um reflection of history which doesn't take into account anything kind of before world, world wars um we do tend to lose this history and then it's almost like the whole world's history has become extremely patriarchal mm. because we're kind of consuming asian arabic culture and western culture more than African culture. We do consume African culture, but it's always through this kind of Western lens, yeah. which means that there's no kind of like, um, re not respect, but for lack of better words, respect given to our, um, you know, historical backgrounds. And ultimately, we do all come from Africa. Therefore, our history is relevant to everybody. And um, picking up on your point about you know, being hyphenated and being multifaceted, which is the way that I see your work. For me as an individual, um, I would describe myself as a polymath, um, someone of the Renaissance. Um, and I think you made a really good point about how within capitalism, particularly this kind of neoconservative capitalism that we're currently living in, it's almost unacceptable to 
be a specialist in more than one area. Mm. Um, and that's, um, I feel, something that's directly attributed to the Industrial Revolution and to, you know, human beings were moving from being in smaller settlements, doing everything themselves, self-contained within a village, supporting their household, to now working in factories and everyone specialising in a specific area. So I 100% agree with everything that you were saying um, in that point. Now, what I wanted to ask you, particularly for our viewers, is that if somebody was learning about you for the first time, um, where would you suggest they start if they want to get to know you and your work? Um, let me see. My website is a good place to start. It's just inuaelams.com, I-N-U-A-E-L-L-A-M-S.com. And there you can find, you could even download my CV, I think. <laughs> um, but um, there's a media page full of interviews and photographs and pictures. Um, there's a shop which is full of um, all, all my books you can, and links to where you can purchase them from. Um, let me see, if you go to the National Theatre streaming website, they are streaming um, one or two of my plays, could you go watch for you know, a nominal amount? Um, but yeah, I think my website is a good place to start. There's a lot of information there on the various events that I curate and the various, um, yeah, the various things that I have created in the past. I'm literally checking it out as we speak. And is there any particular work that you are very, that you feel really proud of? I don't know if proud is the right word, that you really enjoy and you would direct our listeners and viewers at home to check out? Um, I published a book called After Hours in 2017, which, um, it's, it's a set of new poems written by me, but those poems are new versions of poems written by Irish, Scottish, and um, English and, and Welsh poets. So it's, so it's an anthology of those poets, but it's an adaptation of their work written by me set within my specific Nigerian immigrant Irish background, but it's also a diary entry of me trying to write those poems and trying to understand the minds of those British, Irish, Scottish, Welsh um, poets and understanding where their cultural context meets my Nigerian one. And each poem is specific to a year in my life. So it, it reels like, it reads like a coming of age story, like a growth, like a, like a, like, like, like a diary that spans 18, 19 years, but it's also a particular lens through which you understand British identity through my lens. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a really difficult but gorgeous book to write because of the, the, the many cultural touch points and ways of understanding Britishness and Nigerianhood, but migrant life um, and so many different things. So I think After Hours is a good way into, into my brain. Um, yeah. And with After Hours, where can we find that? Um, there are links from my website, um, which just takes you to um, to the publisher's website, Nine Arches, and you can, you can purchase it from them. But I think you can also order it from Amazon. But um, So go, go to Nine Arches, but on my website, there are links there. What can you, I'm really interested in what you can tell us about your sort of preparation for each of your kind of creative outputs. Yeah. Um, as I said, everything starts from poetry. Everything begins as an attempt to pin down the world, to pin down how I understand or misunderstand the world and create a short body of text, which abides by its various rules of poetry, but has an aesthetic um, nest to do with sound, to do with imagery, to do with metaphor, to do with the lyrical quality embedded in songwriting, but not to reach towards songs. I think all my poems um, want to sing um, because I'm hugely influenced by stuff. So, always I want to write a poem, but now and then um, the poem wants a sister poem 
an older brother poem or a younger sister poem, and then it becomes a family of notions or ideas. Then after a while, it, it sort of divides into one character, which is telling me things about the world. Um, and then it begins to form a dialogue with another, with another character. And then it becomes two people in a room talking. And then that might become a play or just a small scene or narrative poem where it creates context where these two people, two people meet. And then oftentimes just becomes um, a much larger play. Um, and after a while, the play goes on somewhere. And because I work in other circles, the play then might begin to flatten into a series of pictures, which means that it could work as a film script or as a TV script. So that's how my work usually germinates and grows from a small idea into a massive, a much bigger thing. But that's, most of the time, I just want to write poems. That is really, really interesting. And I suppose it, it makes actually a lot of sense if one thinks about you and your work and career and even about arts and spoken words and ideas. I suppose it really presents a not only healthy and very connected um, beginning of the work, but it allows you, I suppose, to have a sense of freedom about mm -hmm. the correct direction for that specific work after you've created this amazing piece of poetry. So I think that's quite fantastic. Um, I suppose picking up from that, it would be interesting to find out if there's anything that you've done in terms of your work that you are particularly, um, I don't know how to put it. Um, obviously we've discussed what you're proud of, but I'm interested to know what the kind of highlights of your career are. So was it the first time you saw one of your um, productions on stage or, you know, what were the kind of highlights? Um, the last play I wrote was called Three Sisters, which is an adaptation of a play of the same title by Anton Chekhov. Okay. He was a classic Russian playwright. His play was set three year, four years before the Russian Revolution, and it was about upper middle class Russian women sort of stranded, waiting for um, the soldiers in their lives to give their life meaning and direction. A lot of it is about longing and waiting. Um, and I adapted Chekhov's play and set it during the Nigerian Civil War um, throughout the duration of the war. And the women in the play were in a part in, of Nigeria which was divorced from the rest of the country. They were caught between worlds, which meant that they couldn't escape and they just had to wait also for the soldiers and around them. So I found a way essentially of turning up the heat in Chekhov's play, of, of seeing those Russian characters and adapting them and placing them within a Nigerian context and really um, abiding by the nuts and bolts of Chekhov's play and the characters and, and even down to like dialogue and detail and familial um, relationships, but at the same time adapting it. And the far easier thing was for me just to take the title Three Sisters and, done, you know, and, and did what I wanted to do, but staying true to the original, fastening myself onto the grappling hooks of the story and drawing out the flesh of Nigeria in those years um, was a difficult thing to do. It was, it was hard, but um, I'm, I'm really successful. A couple of things ha has happened since then. One is a bunch of Russian actors who grew up studying Chekhov said that this is the best Chekhov they have seen outside of Russia, which was which was so humbling, but so affirming um, put, um, feedback to get. Um, yeah, so I, I think that Three Sisters was incredible and it was entertaining. There were audiences laughing throughout its run at the National Theater, but it was also completely heartbreaking because even in Nigeria today, um, the Civil War, the Biafran War, isn't taught as history. And part of the reason is because a lot of the perpetrators and um, the soldiers who were involved in that war are still alive. And they are ashamed of what they did, what they were forced to do. 
um, by the powers that be, and everyone had skin in the game. There were um, Egyptian fire um, fighter pilots who were bombing aspects of Nigeria. There were Swedish people. There were Irish weapons dealers working. It was sort of a cold war between England and Russia. So all of those dy dynamics were playing out in this tiny war in which three million people died and were, 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 um, were weaponized against each other and were played off against each other by the British government. So there were people who came to see the play as history and there were Biafran war refugees who lived through the war, who escaped in Nigeria, who went to see the play with their kids and grandchildren saying, this is what we survived. So it solved and ticked so many boxes for me as a writer to create a work that was historical, but it was also living history that, um, that, that stood on, on the shoulder of giants of, um, of which Chekhov was one, but also, pushed the boat a little bit further that made incredible comments and statements about British colonial history and how, the, how that plays out in contemporary times. Um, at the same time, creating this play that was deeply Nigerian and deeply specific. Um, so I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud of that work and of what we achieved. Um, and it stands out to me because of all the moving parts. And also theater is a form for collaboration. When you write, you're not even the most important person in the room. The director tends to be, and the set designer tends to be, because clothing, as you know, can tell such incredible stories. So how a character changes clothes can can can, can explain about your wealth, your mental heads, you know, headspace. So all of us coming together to create this play, which is set, you know, sixty or so years ago, um, meant meant a lot. Yeah. Excellent, really, really inspirational and, and fascinating, particularly your work um, regarding the Russian uh, focus. It's really quite exceptional. Um, I think you should be really proud of everything that you've achieved. Um, I think leading on from that, you know, working in the creative industries is something that I think a lot of people on the outside tend to not understand a lot of what I call the roadblocks and hurdles. So I think what would be quite interesting perhaps for our audiences and viewers at home would be to kind of try and get a feel for some of the challenges that you had to overcome. Um, there were several and some of them I didn't view as challenges because I'm a Nigerian and by that I mean we tend to be a little bit arrogant and, and you know, knuckleheaded more so than West Africans, than the other West Africans. Um, and I just saw it as, rather than a roadblock as a hurdle, or I just need to take a diversion through things. But for instance, I'm not trained in any of the things that I do for a living. Um, haven't been to university. I just kind of started writing and carried on reading until I figured out something and I, I ran with it. Um, some of the difficulty was finding mentorship, finding people to guide me through, but I did. A lot of the people who were my mentors then sort of remain unofficial mentors now. I reach to them when I have questions in my work and I try and create platforms for them as well. Um, let me see, finding the finance to, to, um, to give myself space to write was also really difficult, um, looking for, willing participants and collaborate, collaborators, particularly in the early days of my career was really, really hard. Um, but, and then finding um, um, allies, allies and finding people to advocate on behalf of you was also really difficult. And all of it, you have to put your, your nose to the ground and keep on searching, keep on having lots of conversations. Um, and being trustworthy was also a difficult thing. And there are many reasons why that might be. If you're a person of color, if you find yourself talking to organizations who have far more power than you, and they use that power recklessly, um, it's, it's really difficult trusting. And, but all of it, I, I worked through by just trying to be open, trying to be humble 
always appealing to the better natures of people, believing that better natures do reside in individuals and trying to meet them on my own level and play by my own rules rather than trying to do so at their level because then you're unsure of yourself and they're unsure of you, et cetera. So those are some of the hurdles um, that, I, that I had to battle through. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I think it's actually even more inspiring hearing you talking about these challenges that you have to face in such a positive and productive way. And I certainly feel one of the things that I do kind of miss when I go to Nigeria and West Africa is this really positive way of seeing life. Um, mm. You know, we in the United Kingdom, I feel anyway, can often be quite disparaging, this kind of downtrodden, self-depreciative way of communicating. And then when you travel out, even to other countries in Western civilization, such as the United States of America, I think that people find it quite concerning and confusing that we are so discerning. Mm. Um, so you really reminded me about one of the things I love about being a Nigerian and being from West Africa. Which... Why do you think we are so discerning? I have my theories. I just wonder what you're... Um, I think that, um, well, I, I think really, if you go back, for me personally, I think that it comes from around about the Victorian era, probably Georgian era, there was a period within the United Kingdom where they um, moved from being quite humble to being very ostentatious. And that actually led to a lot of um, the upper classes being attacked, assassinated, their homes being broken into. And I think that what happened was there was this consciousness that, you know, if you have a lot of wealth and if you have a lot of property, then it's better to hide it because, mm -hmm. you know, if the general population, the working classes realize, then they could become, and uh, rightly so, uh, very um, upset about the inequality. Mm -hmm. So I do think that within our culture in British society, it is, um, you know, so the reason I see this is if you look at, Nigerian culture for example you could be around someone who has nothing at all and you could be around someone who's at the highest echelons of society and on a Sunday when they go to church there's no difference that they, they all dress in a very ostentatious way so it's our culture to be bold to be bright to be colorful to do the best that we can whereas in the United Kingdom it's the kind of opposite of that and it's almost seen negatively to be bold, bright, colorful, positive, yeah. and really um, to be, you know, very direct, open and honest about how you are and how you feel. I feel like in our culture, in Britain, um, it's seen as almost, well, particularly more towards England, more than Scotland, um, it's seen as actually quite bad manners to be very direct and yeah. very, open and honest about how one feels but I'm interested in your thoughts on that oh, I think I think that's I think that's that's very perceptive and understand the historical context which gave rise to that mentality um I thought I just thought so there's there's a difference between um um sci-fi when it's written futuristic sci-fi written um in in Africa or here I've sort of in Afrofuturism, a lot of the books set in the future are about a utopia. And here in the West, they tend to be about a dystopia. And I think it's because here in the West, we feel that this is already utopia. We've, you know, we've, we've, we've colonized enough the world and stolen enough riches that we are the apex of humanity. Therefore, the only way is down. Whereas in, in developing parts of the world, the only way is up. So we have to be forward thinking, we have to be positive. Otherwise, um, we, you know, we are screwed. I think there's an element of that, but it's also mixed with our identity um, and our naturally outward perceptive sort of explorative spirits, which is why, you know, um, the earliest humans left Africa and color, you know, went forth to travel across the world and set in all of those places. But I think there is also something to do with colonial shame, which affects um, British identity. And I think that is because of 
um, a lack of the willingness to engage with history enough to overcome it. Because once you claim the wrongdoings, you can go forth. But I think overwhelmingly, the British consciousness ends at guilt. And then we refuse to address things rather than push past it. So I think a lot of, I think some of that is merged with that, that false humility or that, 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 that hide wealth. 100%. Because, you know, we know that history is written by um, the winners, okay. as it were. And I do feel like popular culture and ideological state apparatus, maybe the television, media, does kind of rewrite history in a way that isn't actually accurate. And we kind of touched upon that earlier in the discussion. So I think that your points on that are extremely valid. Um, I am aware that we are running out of time. Yeah, but before we go, I do want to ask you one last question. And um, you've described yourself as a poet, a playwright, and um, a fantasist and a thief. Um, can you elaborate on why you describe yourself in that way? Um, as a fantasist and a thief. A fantasist is because um, one of my one of my earliest inspirations in terms of writing is um, Terry Pratchett who passed away um, a few years ago, unfortunately. And he was a fantasist. He created a world which abide by which which abides by rules of his invention and and told the most incredible stories within it, which have direct parallels with with humanity, with actual, with real life. Um, most of his novels are set on a disc world, which is a world not unlike Earth, but it is flat. Water drips up the side. It is balanced on the back of four giant elephants swimming through space who are on the back of a giant turtle swimming through space. And in it, the most incredible characters rich, um, live the richest of lives. And I remember thinking, how does he do so? Um, and that was... That was, that was, it was through his books that I fell in love with literature and through that wondering if I could create similar worlds that I eventually put pen to paper and started writing. So um, I, I fell in love with writing, with reading through fantasy and I invent worlds and tell and write stories and come up with characters. So I'm carrying on in that fantastic tradition, but also elements of, of uh, magical realism of fantasy also permeates West African culture and also come through and bubble through my work. So um, yeah, that's where that aspect of my description comes from. But being a thief, I think, simply is to completely accept the fact that I'm not an originator of many of my ideas. And this is to say, no one really is. The saying that there's nothing new under the sun is true and it is actual. All we do are echoes of our past selves, our past lives, our past ancestors. Um, and we're echoes of the world we see, we ingest and regurgitate in interesting ways. So I am a thief, I'm conscious of it even when I'm unconsciously stealing things. But what I'm hyper aware of is that I remix things much in the way early hip hop records were created in which hip hop was, was, was constructed itself was by remixing records. And I think that is where my artistry comes from is from, un, is from remixing Chekhov and set it in a pre-colonial Nigeria to write a play that is about British politics in the present day. So I, I steal, I'm actively stealing from things but I create something new from that. Thank you so much. On behalf of FMA, I would like to say thank you so much for this incredible, I suppose, delve into your work and into your journey. Um, I have been Eunice Lumide. Um, Please feel free to contact us if you have any further questions and please do check out his work on his website. Thank you so much. It's thank been fantastic you. having you. Thank you. It's been really great speaking with you too. Thank you.